Well, Steve Gallant joins me in the studio now. He's an author who was convicted of murder back in 2005, was in high security prisons, and went on to become a hero of the London Bridge terror attacks. But Steve has, I think, a deeply disturbing story of what he saw firsthand in Franklin High Security Prison, and he now believes is happening right throughout our prison service. Steve, there were rival gangs inside this prison, Islamist gangs against other gangs. Yeah, well, um, you could say non-Muslim, predominantly white yep. groups of people. Yeah, so, I mean, as a lot of people know, I, I spent a very long time in, in prison. Yep. Um, but one of the first prisons I went to was HMB Franklin, which was relatively quiet at the time until we had an influx of people being convicted of terrorist-related offences. At first, um, some of the prisoners were there, took an offence to their presence, and, and, and they set about sort of attacking them and stuff like that. And then sort of very light tit-for-tat skirmishes started off, but then... More started to influx into the into the prisons. Uh, numbers started to grow, and they started to retaliate. And at that time, we'd seen some pretty grotesque violence. I mean, some some guys had hot oil poured over their head, and there was a you know, retaliatory attack of someone else getting hot oil poured over their head. And it, just, stuff. Yeah, it, it was bad stuff, yeah. And it just exploded into this quite a large um, gang war between two two mm. two sides. But we've now got a situation where eighteen percent of the prison population are Muslim. As you said a moment ago, the numbers in prison are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the move towards a quite extreme form of Islam is there too, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, my, my, my concern is that, look, you know, everyone has a right to convert to anything they want. You know, we, we have a free society. But um, from what I saw in the prison system was people weren't converting because suddenly they become pious. I saw people converting because some of them were scared, some were coerced into that. Some thought, well, this is the most powerful gang and this yeah. is where I can get protection. And so they joined it. So it was in my, my opinion, for the wrong reasons. And when I look at those, those figures now, I wonder to what extent how many of those people have converted for that reason. Well, 20% of the Muslim population are white Christian prisoners originally who have converted in prison. Are they taking over? Are these groups... I mean, there's even talk in some prisons <clears throat> of them having their own Sharia courts. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I've never come across that because it's, it's a very funny, dynamic place as the prison system and things are hidden behind closed doors. You can go behind your cell door with a group of people and do what you want, for example. Yeah. Um, I hear about that stuff myself, but I have seen a lot of um, people being bullied, being influenced... And, and, you know, some people, yeah, coerced into conversions. No doubt about that. What are the authorities doing? What are the prison governors doing? What, you know, what are the prison officers doing? Or are they scared you of know, being called racist if they act? It seemed there's a lot of timidity going on. I mean, in one prison I was in, in Cat B, called H&P Gartry. At the time, there was... Um, I think they that allowed this, uh, a number of Muslim prisoners to start praying in, in the education block, which is fine. But then it spread onto the wings and... and you know, again, you know, yeah, you're okay to pray, but the problem was that some of these gangs who were praying at five minutes earlier had been attacking people, and it's very intimidating for people on the wings. Yeah. And I felt it was it was done to appease, but it wasn't respected at all. It was just they so far it was weak for allowing them to do that, so it wasn't respected. And if people are being radicalised mm -hmm. in prison in the way in which you say they are, not just in Cat A, but in Cat B prisons as well, all of which makes me wonder, what are we putting out onto the streets? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the obvious... Concern. I mean, look, I saw it all those years ago, and if I saw it, then surely the authorities saw it. But the lack of action was profound. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I know there's been some some efforts to do something about it, but when you look at the state of the prison system, when you look at the, the, the staff, you know, lack of staff, you know, there's the lack of retention, lack of resources. Bad morale. Bad morale, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And if it's getting worse and worse and worse, <laughs> how are these things, which I saw all those years ago, being tackled? You know, it, it doesn't, doesn't look good. Doesn't look good at all. No. no. And, 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 and we are covering prisons on this show quite regularly. You know, prison is there partly to punish, but also we hope that people will be redeemed, people will admit their wrongs and go back into society. Yeah. Doesn't feel like it's happening. Well, you know, look, one of the things when you've got you know, a gang, it could be any gang, but in this particular instance, Islamist gangs who are gaining an influence across the prison system, you've got, you've got two problems that come from that. One is, yes, those, those ideas can be spread onto people who might one day get out, and that puts society at danger. Yeah. And the other is, when you have gangs, you know, holding sway on prison landings, it creates fear. And when people are scared and thinking about their survival, they're not thinking about education and rehabilitation and what they're going to do when they get out. They're thinking of that, how yeah. to survive from day to day. Yeah. Well, and that has impacts itself. 
Now, the prison service spokesman has said, staff act swiftly to clamp down on intimidating or threatening behaviour, regardless of cultural or religious sensitivities, and our £100 million investment into tough security measures is helping stop the contraband which fuels violence and gangs behind bars. Well, we can believe that or believe it not. But, Steve Gallant, you were involved in something very gallant. It was the Usman Khan terrorist attack that took... Islamist terrorist attack that took place on London Bridge, and you were out on day release. I was, yeah, and, and it was my first out of prison. First day? It, first day, yeah, in 14 and a half years. And funny enough, it was, it was my first act of violence in 14 and a half years, so I'd stayed out of trouble all those years. Yeah, yeah. Um, but thankfully this time it was for the right reasons. You know, terrible event, we lost yeah. two amazing people, yeah. but thankfully I was there to stop a little bit more yeah. from happening, and, and, and yeah, I intervened that day, and ended up taking us down, can down on, the, on London Bridge, and where he was ultimately shot dead. And you went to Buckingham Palace? I did, yes, and I, I was awarded a Queen's Gallantry Medal. Well, you know what, Steve? They didn't exactly give those out with the rations, do no. they? So well done you, and you've got your story here in a book. I, I do, yes, and actually I brought this as a, as a gift yep. uh, to you, so it is my book. It, it chronicles my journey from the beginning of my sentence to the yep. end, but it also covers some of the issues that we spoke about yep. just a moment ago. So. There we are. The Road to London Bridge by Steve Gallant, and it is one hell of a story. And I'm looking forward to reading it.